very loud, <laughs> um, that you guys should all try those toothbrushes that are at the snack bar because they are so weird. Like they have like toothpaste in the bristles and you're like you're using it and you eat the toothpaste and it tastes like poison, but like minty poison. So yeah, everyone go check that out. <laughs> um, so my talk right now is going to be about uh, designing for Wonder and I wanted to start off by sharing with you guys two things that I really love. So, okay, show of hands. Who's ever been here before? Oh yeah, who's ever been here before? This is like no people, <laughs> this is like five people. <laughs> yeah, okay, listen to that girl. <laughs> Um, this is the Museum of Jurassic Technology in Los Angeles, and it is my favorite museum in the world. It is this really beautiful, intimate space that, um, contrary to its name, has nothing to do with dinosaurs and everything to do with housing this weird collection of eccentric, scientific, and artistic artifacts from history, like a scale model of Noah's Ark oil paintings from the Soviet space dog program, a extensive documentation on the origins of Cat's Cradle, <laughs> a retrospective on the historical cures for throat ailments by eating mice, <laughs> a 17th century botanical clock that tells the time based off the, the direction that a sunflower faces the sun. It's really nice. And then my favorite, uh, which I know does not look like anything, but it is a lead block that was collected in 1952, and it houses this thing called a deprong mori, or piercing devil. And that is a rare African bat that emits x-ray waves instead of sonar, thereby allowing it to pass through solid objects. So that's just a sampling of all of the weird, bizarre things that you're going to find at the Museum of Jurassic Technology. Second thing I love. This is my copy of the Codex Seraphinianus. Uh, it's this huge book. It weighs like 10 pounds. Um, and you know, depending on the edition, this is actually really rare. Like I was just looking this up, and some editions cost like $7,000 on eBay. Uh, mine does not cost that much. It's this. Illustrated encyclopedia of a collection of topics from biology to art to mathematics to history. And it has these beautiful hand drawn illustrations of plants, people, animals, mechanisms, games, and this thing. <laughs> What, what, what is that? <laughs> uh, and so the incredible thing about this book is that it's written in uh, this really meticulous handwritten type that's in this strange and unknown alphabet. And there's literally hundreds of pages of incomprehensible but incredibly detailed like annotations and graphs and charts and all of that stuff. Uh, that to this date, no one has been able to decode. So that and the unknown origins of where all this content came from make this book really intriguing to me. And so I wanted to share the Codex Seraphinianus and the Museum of Jurassic Technology, not only because they're just really freaking cool, but also because they share something in common, which if you haven't already guessed, is that uh, there are aspects to them that are not real. So take the museum, for example. Um, while like half of the artifacts are actually authentic, others just simply came from the curator's imagination. So no, there is not actually a thing called a bat that can fly through walls. Um, but the imaginary artifacts are just as, uh, or have as much backstory and evidence as the real ones to the point where they're basically indistinguishable. And then if you look at the Codex Seraphinianus, it looks and feels like a book 
that was made hundreds of years ago. Uh, but it was actually published in 1981 by this Italian designer. And he took incredible pains to flesh out this like imaginary history of human existence uh, so it seemed convincing and credible. And that's what I really love about both of these things, that they present fiction with the same earnesty and seriousness as they present fact. And in doing so, they create this suspension of disbelief where all of these impossible sounding ideas seem pretty believable. And so you might have heard of this thing called uh, wounder cabinets or cabinets of curiosity. They were the early predecessors to museums. And what they were were a collection of wonderful objects from around the world where the focus was less on whether an object was true, but whether it evoked amazement. Uh, and the purpose of these fantastical elements was to elevate the collection as a whole. So for example, if you take a unicorn horn, it's this wondrous object. And then you take a seashell, which is common. But when you juxtapose the two together and start seeing the commonalities, your perspective of that seashell changes and it can become just as beautiful and marvelous as something from fantasy. Uh, and that's an idea that I, I really, really like. Um, the idea of using wonder as a way to reframe reality. And I think that's what the Codex and the museum do really well. They remind us that our world is just as full of cool, spectacular things. And so everything I've been talking about uh, all lives under this genre of magical realism. And I wanted to talk about it just because it's like my favorite genre and it's really hard to explain, but I'm gonna do my best. Um, it's a term that comes from literature and film. So uh, for example, if you've ever read any like uh, books by Murakami or Borges or seen any Miyazaki films, like those all live in the genre of magical realism. And at its core is this, an acceptance of magic in a rational world. Okay, so what does that even mean? <laughs> uh, that means, or it's where the unbelievable and supernatural things happen as a normal part of everyday life. So a really good example of this is the film Birdman. The setting takes place in New York and the camera follows the protagonist as he goes about his day. And then all of a sudden he's levitating in his underwear. <laughs> and it's not a hallucination, it's not a dream sequence, this is actually happening and it's just an ordinary part of his morning routine. Magic is normal for him and so that's an example of magical realism. And just like wonder cabinets, magical realism juxtaposes the ordinary with the extraordinary, which allows us to kind of um, reassess our everyday lives. Because if your worldview involves levitation and bats that can fly through walls, then it's not actually that hard to look at the more mundane aspects of your life, like you know, your commute or getting coffee or going grocery shopping and wonder if they have the possibility to be extraordinary as well. And so often as designers, we kind of think of design as just problem solving. Or, I mean, problem solving is great, but <laughs> there's more to that. Design also has the ability to influence our perspective of the world uh, and to elicit like this emotional response. And so I want to show you guys an example of this through a project that I had the opportunity to work on. And it combined magical realism, design, and San Francisco, and it was called the Latitude Society. And so it's possible that maybe some of you from San Francisco have participated in this before it closed. And for that, I apologize because I am breaking the code of absolute discretion. The Latitude Society was a project produced by this group called Nonchalance. Um, they specialize in this thing that they called situational design. And so they were the same people who did uh, the project, the Jejun Institute. So if you were lucky enough to participate in that, or you watch the documentary, The Institute, which is about it, which I think everyone should watch because it's really weird, <laughs> you will definitely have a better understanding of what the Latitude Society was. 
The latitude society is really hard to describe. <laughs> I can only sum it up in slashes. So it was a game slash secret society slash narrative adventure slash real community slash not a cult. Like, I was not a part of a cult. I have to keep reminding everyone about this because they already think I'm weird enough and like, I don't need this. Um, and so rather than try to explain it, let me tell you about my first experience with the Latitude Society. So I went into work one day and there's this card lying on my desk. And so I open it and saw that it didn't have any markings or explanations. It was just a code and a link to a website. And so I have no idea what this card is about. Like, is it a credit card? Is it like a Starbucks gift card? Like, what, what's happening? And so I go on the website and it tells me to make an appointment to visit this thing called the San Francisco House of the Latitude. And I'm just like, okay, why not? Like, sounds super cool, let's just do this. <laughs> Uh, and it has this cryptic message that I need to find something called the signal. Oops. And so I go to the address, and it looks super sketchy. <laughs> like, it's in the Mission District, if you're wondering. <laughs> and I don't know what's going on, and I'm like, okay, this is either gonna be the coolest thing ever, or I'm about to get murdered. <laughs> and there's a card reader on the door. And so it has the same hex mark that's on my card, and so I'm like, okay, I will try to swipe it in. And it clicks, and actually opens. And I end up in this very oddly decorated tiny room. And I start realizing that there are no doors and no other ways to go other than down that hole. <laughs> so I was like, okay, screw it. <laughs> I'm already here. I'm gonna jump down this hole. <laughs> And it turned out to be this like story tall wooden slide that dropped me down into this lobby. And in this room, there are three doors, and one of them has this pulsating sign right above it. So I'm like, okay, obviously it wants me to go through that door. <laughs> and when I open the door, I end up in this hallway that looks exactly like this. It is pitch black. <laughs> it's super scary, but I don't have anywhere else I can go, so I just start walking forward, trying to figure and like feel my way around. And I start realizing that the carpet, or the hallway is completely carpeted, like on the floor, on the walls, on the ceiling. And as I make my way down the hallway, I realize, like, to my horror, that it's getting narrower and narrower and shorter and shorter to the point where I literally have to crawl on my hands and knees to go forward. And I, by the way, I'm like super claustrophobic, so this was like the most terrifying thing in my life. And I don't know, I was just freaking out and I wanted this tunnel to end. And then five minutes in, I totally lose track of which direction I'm going and I'm about to have a panic attack until I hear this whoop loud, <laughs> uh, soothing music coming from somewhere off in the distance. And I'm like, okay, okay, everything's gonna be okay as long as I just move towards that music. And so I keep crawling and the music gets louder. And then finally, it shoots me out into this library. And there's a book sitting on the podium in front of me and I decide to open it, and it's totally blank, and I'm like, okay, what's going on? And then all of a sudden, uh, the lights start to dim, and the book starts to glow, and words appear on the pages. And the book starts reading itself to me, and it tells the story of a village that walled itself off from the rest of the world, and a group of people who had tunneled out of the village to see new places, meet new people, and experience new things. And that ritual of entering the tunnel and coming back to retrieve other people from the village lasted for hundreds of years, eventually becoming the Latitude Society. 
And I realized like, oh wow, that, that was just the tunnel that I crawled through. That was the tunnel in the story. That's really cool. And so I exit this library and I end up in a bar. Unfortunately, I don't have a picture of the bar. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, wow, that was crazy, that was amazing. Like, there's this whiskey on the table, so like, obviously I'm gonna drink it, and like, like great, like, nice parting gift. <laughs> and I'm just there, like, sipping my whiskey, being like, oh, what, what, what a fun experience. Like, how, how nice that, like, this fun house exists. <laughs> and then a phone next to me starts to ring. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and so I pick up the phone, because I'm alone at this bar, and the voice tells me, this experience isn't over. <laughs> it tells me to go outside into the city and start exploring, and it gives me these missions, like to find a marker embedded in a street, which leads to another marker embedded in a street, <laughs> which leads to me exchanging this ticket with my local bartender for this coin at a bar and I start getting messages from the society. And they take me to all of these secret places within the city where there's like artwork that I've never noticed before. And I'm just like moving my way around. It's been like three hours and I'm just running around San Francisco. And it gets to the point where I'm just like, this is crazy. Like how did I miss all of this stuff? This was just embedded into the city all the years that I've been living here and I never noticed it. And I walk on these streets all the time. And it was in that moment where I was like, what else am I missing about this city? Like what, what other magical things about this city exist? And so the whole experience ends at this place called the Den Arcadia, where I take the coin that I received and I put it inside this retro Tempest arcade machine and instead of letting, oh, no sound. Instead of letting me play the game, this creepy guy starts talking to me. <laughs> or like insulting me mostly. <laughs> and he tells me, the signal is anomaly. Okay, I get it. That's what the hell I was looking for this whole entire time. The signal is anomaly. I just wanna see this animation, it's really cool. <laughs> And that's the story of how I was able to log into a website. <laughs> this was the craziest sign up flow I have ever experienced in my life. <laughs> and so what I just walked you through was just the tip of the iceberg. Like the Latitude Society built up this entire world filled with adventures and communal gatherings and games. And their goal, they had a really important goal apart from just making this super rad experience. And it was to create a community of people and get them to look at the city in a different way. Get them to see the city as more of a playground than a place to just live or kind of be afraid of. And they did this by injecting magic and like hidden secrets everywhere. Um, and as a, as a side note, like the Latitude Society actually closed down last year and uh, I think it's really interesting that the whole entire community that was a part of it, they actually still exist. They meet up all the time to go on excur excursions like every single week. Uh, and I think that's like a real testament to how when you create something like this memorable and wonderful and people engage with it, that it creates like a real kind of you know, measure of success. And what you have to remember is that everything that I just described, all that entire experience, uh, that was all designed. And that design started out looking like this. So this is just a basic sign up workflow. Like you guys, we've all probably designed something like this. And most people approach designing sign up flows in a very typical way. Like, it's one of those peripheral things that you're just trying to get the user through as quickly and easily as possible, and then you're done. Uh, but the Latitude Society challenged that assumption and took a completely different approach. And they created something really emotional and wonderful because of that. And it's the same story as what we do as designers. Every time we design a new app or a piece of hardware, 
we have the opportunity to challenge people's assumptions of what that product could be. And so it's WWDC, like Apple is a really great example of this. Um, a really great example of where this happens uh, because they ask these types of questions. So like, what if a laptop LED wasn't a laptop LED, but a breath? What if a watch did more than just tell time? What if we could create the illusion, an illusion so believable that a device could be seen as human? Um, because there's more to an experience than just functionality, right? There's the opportunity for us to add wonder and create something really memorable in everything we design. The end.